Welcome to the World Water Day webinar hosted by the United Nations University Hub at the University of Calgary. We're thrilled to have you join us today for this insightful discussion on building resilience to environmental change. As we gather here to commemorate World Water Day, we are reminded of the critical importance of water on our lives and ecosystems. Today's webinar promises to be enlightening as we delve into the crucial topic of resilience amidst environmental shifts. Before we proceed, we would like to begin with land acknowledgements to recognize the traditional territories on which we live and gather. The University of Calgary, located in the heart of Southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksiga, the Bigana, Bigani, and the Gaina First Nations, the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. So just to introduce myself, my name is Catherine Reese, and I'm a civil engineering PhD student at the Schulich School of Engineering, where I build models to predict wildfires and their hydrologic impacts under the supervision of Professor Clark. I would first like to introduce Dr. Merle Ballard, who is an associate professor in the Department of Earth, Energy and Environment at the University of Calgary. She stood up the new Indigenous Science Division at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Anishinaabe from Lake St. Martin First Nation, Dr. Ballard's latest research explores three-eyed seeing and how our fluency in Anishinaabe mowing can transform approaches to water resource management using Anishinaabe mowing baseline indicators. Dr. Ballard also serves on a number of committees and working groups two of which are recent appointments at scoping expert for the second IPPES Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, an expert for the IPPES Task Force on Indigenous and Local Knowledge. She currently holds an NSERC, which stands for National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and CIHR, Canadian Institutes for Health Research Grants, her other research interests include, but are not limited to, climate, species at risk, sustainability of flooding, and Our second panelist is Dr. Kathy Ryan, who is a professor with the Department of Earth, Energy and Environment in the Faculty of Science. Dr. Ryan is leading a large project on integrated groundwater, surface water, climate assessment of the Eastern slopes of the Rockies River where she enjoys both recreating and working with community and industry stakeholders. Our third panelist is Dr. Kelly Monkitrick, who is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science. Dr. Monkitrick's research focuses on improving the sensitivity of environmental monitoring programs. He has worked with various governments to improve environmental assessment models and has taught in more than a dozen countries. So with such distinguished experts on our panel, we are sure to gain valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities surrounding water resilience in the face of environmental change. So before we start the first, with the first question, I want to encourage all participants to engage and to share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A that is at the bottom of the Zoom page. Now to dive into the, the discussion. So to the, all the panelists, what is your definition of resilience? And if we could start with Merle Ballard first. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, to me, resilience, uh, being a First Nation, is a demonstrated uh, through my peoples, my own peoples. Uh, because resilience is being to withstand anything that's uh, uh, thrown at you, done to you through legislation, etc. Uh, for example, um, 
uh, we're talking about water, the importance of water, and uh, 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 for First Nations, uh, the Indigenous peoples, uh, they're very resilient uh, to whatever comes their way, whether a catastrophe or uh, 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 being displaced from the land. Well, they're resilient, uh, they have to be, because um, uh, they know what to do uh, to look at. Uh, to look after themselves, so um, as we call it. Yeah. Okay, that's a good definition. Um, Kathy, would you like to add your definition of resilience? Sure. So when you asked that question, Catherine, the first thing I thought of was an an analogy about trees, and that trees that are able to bend under unexpected forces or wind they don't break and they don't die. So I think to me, resilience is being able to take on unexpected forces that aren't usually positive and manage through them and, and see through to the other side. Mm. That's a very good analogy, actually. Um, Kelly, would you like to add your thoughts? Sure. The uh, For me, the resilience has to do with both withstanding and recovering from impacts and and the concept originated in the 70s when people thought of things as relatively short term like a, a flood a fire a drought an oil spill and for me the changing climate is is something different than that it's not really a short term change so i think we really need to think of it more in in an adaptation phase we we need to learn how to deal with a multi-generational stress which is not going to end in the short term hmm. that's very true as a follow-up question to all of you um do you believe that the concept of maladaptation feeds into your definition of resilience and or in other words how do you see maladaptation maladapt maladaptation fitting into your understanding of resilience. Uh, you, we can start with Kelly this time. Sure. So for me, mal 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 <laughs> maladaptation <laughs> has to do with, with change that's that's more harmful than helpful. And if we, th we think of, of adapting to a warming climate as a long-term long um, adaptation, then maladaptation are things that are really focusing on the short term. You know, one quick example is people consistently still build in floodplains of rivers and and strategies that people are using are relatively short term focus. How do we how do we rebuild those houses? How do we build temporary uh, containment structures or some way to prevent that flooding rather than accepting that flooding is a part of our future and people shouldn't build in the floodplain. So really it's it's focusing on a short-term uh, adaptation rather than recognizing that we need to prepare for long-term change. Kathy, what are, what are, what are your thoughts on, on what Kelly has said and as well as your thoughts on maladapt maladaptation and resilience? Well, Kelly took my analogy. I was going to talk yeah. about uh, when rivers meander through areas that have uh, urban areas close to the river, that often we will put up um, big, huge pieces of concrete or barriers to try to stop them from meandering. But in truth, we know they're going to me meander and at some extreme flooding event that will be broken through and, and more damage will have will happen. So I was, you know, scrambling to try to think of another analogy. And one might be uh, uh, in India, there's wide use of groundwater to irrigate, to provide food, and they're over pumping their aquifers and, you know, th they're running out of groundwater and having to drink, dig or drill, sorry, deeper and deeper wells. And so that's a complete maladaptation that will end up with no water supply from the common source of groundwater in the region, then they'll be in really big trouble. So a better adaptation would have been to plan to irrigate, irrigate more efficiently or use different crops that require less water, et cetera. 
Mm. Merle, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, to me, I'm all at the well, <laughs> like Kelly. A, a, lot of word. <laughs> a lot of all, a lot of it there. Malad, mal, uh, maladaptation. I should have practiced saying that. Maladaptation is uh, um, a lot of my work is around flooding. So uh, for First Nations, the, pe uh, the Indigenous people I work with, uh, there's a lot of maladaptation because they're never given proper resources uh, to adapt so uh, to flooding. So it's it's kind of a bad aid, band aid approach. So, um, and also um, maladaptation when we, of, uh, regarding water and flooding, uh, there needs to be um, uh, the integration of both of the knowledge systems, which is very important, um, the Western science and the indigenous science. And uh, with that, uh, uh, once we start doing that, listening to um, using both of the knowledge system, I think we can be more adaptive, uh, pro adaptive, pro adapt, pro adaptive versus maladaptive. Okay, <laughs> that word was just designed to make us laugh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your insightful responses. I do think that this is a great segue to a question that I have for you, Merle. Your work integrates indigenous knowledge and language into environmental resilience research. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how has your understanding of indigenous knowledge and language influenced your research? And how do you perceive the role of indigenous knowledge and language in enhancing efforts to build resilience? Yeah. I think this is a really good question because uh, my language, Anishinaabeam one, is my mother tongue. So I didn't learn the language. And this is the language that I was raised in right from uh, when I started birth. So uh, it's really important to understand the, the language. Like Anishinaabeam one is uh, such a powerful language because within our language, we have the root words identify what the words mean. and a lot of the work that I'm doing is around place names. Uh, so understanding the place names, the root word of the language. A lot of the place names given to the ecosystem by the indigenous peoples across Canada, uh, North America, South America even, are based on the, the words are given as the indigenous peoples understand the, what the what their function is in the ecosystem, like the way the re, uh, rivers meander, the ebb and flow of the waters, et cetera, where the fish spawn along the streams, uh, the way the current flows, uh, the way the, um, um, uh, like the trees bunch up along the point, uh, the points of the lake, et cetera. Uh, these are very important to understand. Once you start to understand these and the work that I'm doing, you'll start to identify the indigenous meaning of the words, the root meaning. And from there, you'll start to, uh, when you talk to the elders, the ones who have uh, the knowledge of uh, the words, the understanding, uh, the deeper understanding, uh, you can start identifying what the, the biological monitors, what the biological indicators are to the original naming of the word based on the place where it was named. Um, and from there track what the changes are throughout the centuries, decades, et cetera. And uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can start uh, to understand what like uh, from the original landscape of the way it looked like uh, the original forms of the rivers, lakes, etc., to the present. And uh, you can start to understand uh, the erosion, uh, the changes in fish, uh, the changes in water, etc. So it's really important that to understand, uh, 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 to acknowledge that the words that they um, describe what uh, the ecosystem was originally when when they were named. 
Thank you for that insightful answer. And that's very true. It's very often you read reports of flooding that occur in a place. And when you look up the original name of the place, it indicates that there was a river or a lake in that original environment. So that is very, very true. Um, going to Kathy, your research focuses on integrating groundwater, surface water, and climate assessments. What challenges and opportunities do you see in integrating these aspects and how can this integrated approach inform sustainable water resource management practices? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So we're working, we have the privilege of working in the Rocky Mountain block, which is a super important source of water to southern Alberta. So the water that arrives in Calgary's rivers, the bow and the elbow, 90% of it was, was uh, generated and put into the main stem of the river in the mountains. So most of it comes from the mountains. And in the mountains, most of the water, well, in the world and also in the mountains, most of the water is under the ground surface, or I should say most of the water that isn't salty or frozen is under the ground's surface as groundwater. So we often refer to mountains which supply, you know, a really significant uh, amount of the world's population through rivers like this and through groundwater generation. We often call them water towers, but I am an advocate of calling them groundwater towers. And right now in, in Alberta, almost all of the river is from groundwater that's flowed into the, into the river in the mountains. So groundwater is super important and it's not really well understood, you know, which rock formations it comes from, when does it enter the river? And more importantly, how does it contribute to extreme events like the drought that, that much of Southern Alberta is really concerned about uh, might get worse this, this coming season. So we are working to tease out uh, from where and when the groundwater goes into the river and look back at the historic data that's been collected to understand how that's changed with climate change so far and how it will change going further. Um, and I just wanted to end this opportunity with two, two messages from other people. So one is from the president of the International Association of Hydrogeologists who put out a message called, called Groundwater for Peace uh, for World Water Day. So 30 to 50% of the world's population, often in the most desperate or the most underserved and the most underserved regions rely on groundwater, often as the only water supply source. And Dave Kramer said that groundwater is the Earth's last lifeline in the face of the onslaught of climate change and population growth. And last night I had the privilege of seeing Merle uh, talk and she talked about how in the indigenous way of knowing or being, I hope I'm using that language right Merle, that we have an obligation to speak for uh, parts of our ecosystem that don't have voices. And one of those parts is water and probably the part of that of the water ecosystem that has the quietest and least listened to voices is groundwater. Thanks, Catherine. No problem. Um, Kelly, you have extensive experience teaching and working in a diversity of countries. What variations in environmental challenges have you observed and what are the commonalities that exist in the approaches to building resilience in these different parts of the world? Sure, I, th I think there's a lot more similarity than than differences, especially in in the stresses. I do quite a bit in South America. They're looking at melting glaciers. Um, they're looking at severe drought. They're looking at fires. They're looking at atmospheric rivers. The same kinds of of things um, that 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 we have to deal with. Um, and in the work that we do in the north you know, the, the, and in the far south, the, the climate is changing much faster than uh, the global average. And depending who you talk to, it might be four or six times faster. And, and they're having to deal with a lot of uh, challenges with things like permafrost thaw and uh, 
And, and so one of our the big challenges is that a lot of attention still fo focused on the short term and immediate risks. Um, I'm part of a national uh, advisory committee for a national research network in Chile on trying to improve water availability for agriculture and mining. And, and the kinds of things they're looking at are things like water reuse, which is a big issue in lots of the world. How do we take all this municipal wastewater and stormwater, which is just going um, and carrying contaminants into the river and, and use it in more, uh, more focused ways. So how do we clean that water to get reuse out of it? And in Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin went through a similar drought issue that, that we're gonna be facing now in, in uh, Alberta. They, they took a unique approach. They went from a, a system like we have where provincial uh, control over water licenses and the federal government took it over and took back 40% of the flow of the river for ecological purposes and uh, instrumented the irrigation uh, to increase water efficiency and productivity of the farmers um, and use their allocation rather than a license uh, as a tradable market uh, commodity and uh, ended up greatly improving the quality of the, of the ecological system in the river, as well as improving the efficiency of the farming quite dramatically and improving the economics for the farmer. So I, I think there's lots of lessons out there that we can, we can look to um, and not reinvent the wheel. That's true. Oftentimes we, when we're looking for answers, we, we do want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, but as you're saying, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, so at this time, we're going to take some questions from our audience. Um, and then if anyone still has questions and they haven't uploaded their answers, you can just go to the Q&A section at the bottom and submit questions. I invite everyone to participate and engage with our lovely panelists. Don't forget <laughs> to ask. Anyway, um, so the first question is from Ignacio Aguirre, and he's saying that a key point in University of Calgary's plan ahead of tomorrow, they want to do a lot of transdisciplinary approaches to research. So he wants to know how it is that moving forward, we can address water issues and incorporate different kinds of knowledge and experts. Would any of our panelists like to take that one? Oh, Kathy, would you like to go ahead? I would say that not just transdisciplinary, but, but different knowledge systems, which is what Merle is, is working on, is the only way. You know, I, I have the privilege of working with the Bow River Basin Council, who's the WPAC in Alberta, or the Watershed Policy Advisory Council for the Bow River Basin, which is a fairly large basin. I should know the area, but I don't. And they have quarterly fora in which stakeholders from all manner of water adjacent fields come to, and it never fails to amaze me how many people are involved in water, which already, you know, the water system, the natural system that supplies water to us and the, the water cycle and the way that water is taken out of the river and used consumptively or not used consumptively, how groundwater is used, it's already so complicated. Uh, the only way that we can make any good progress is by having long conversations and often with people from fields who use different language than we use. So, you know, I'm, I'm a hydrogeologist. Kelly is an aquatic ecologist. It takes us a little bit longer to get on the same page and understand that we're talking about the same thing or different things. And I don't think there's anything more important from a, from a water resources perspective than doing this work. That's very true. Merle, would you like to address the question as well. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the University of Calgary, I think, is uh, doing an excellent job in addressing, uh, 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 incorporating other no knowledge systems uh, and the use of Indigenous science is, uh, is uh, it, uh, 
Others of Indigenous science is important, um, as well too, the hiring of uh, Indigenous scholars in the Faculty of Science is a good move uh, towards that. Because Indigenous science, um, Indigenous knowledge can enhance, uh, complement uh, the work that we're doing right now uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the panel, uh, the work of the panel, and as well as other faculty researchers within the university. So uh, it, uh, it makes it uh, stronger, uh, more powerful and to incorporate uh, both of the researches because uh, um, I, I would says in the Canadian legislation as well as other uh, recommendations from our United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, various uh, studies uh, throughout Canada, uh, uh, the TRC, uh, Truth and Reconciliation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, report um, uh, recommends that uh, indigenous science, indigenous knowledge, be used as part of uh, the teaching uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the teaching institutions. So, and uh, legislation to uh, Canadian legislation where I have to uh, uh, we have to. Or where you have to incorporate indigenous science, indigenous knowledge into the work uh, studies that uh, that um, researchers are doing, as well as uh, towards a, de a development, etc. Yes, there's a lot of opportunity to bridge the divide, so to speak, and bring in they bring in a lot of people with a diversity of backgrounds and terms and. And knowledge. Um, Kelly, do you want to speak to to that? Well, maybe just to touch on a on a, a slightly different issue. Um, on, on the panel here, we have people that are are very involved, as as Kathy was mentioning, with external stakeholder groups and and with uh, um, various partners. It's and so I wouldn't think of it as just a transdisciplinary as as much as a multi sectoral thing. There's a large number of academics who still focus on traditional academic indicators like how many papers do I get, how many students do I have, how much funding do I have, and and we really need more people to get involved in public awareness, policy engagement, and and uh, focusing on outcomes as opposed to, to outputs, and, and really spending more time with the youth because this this issue is going to be their generation and future generations issue. And uh, and that's really one of the big successes we've had in the Ch Chilean group that we're working with is is getting them to really focus a lot on in engaging with the educational system and with external stakeholders to to try and mobilize the the knowledge that they're developing. That's that's good to know. Actually, the person who asked the question is from Chile, so. That's <laughs> Um, the next question is from Willem, and Willem is asking, would our current agricultural as well as oil and gas approaches also count as maladaptation? For that matter, are any of our current methods of using water uh, maladaptation? Which I think uh, Kathy touched on when she spoke about the groundwater being used to irrigate the fields, which had a negative feedback but I'll allow Dr. Kathy to to start us off with that question. Yeah, so we're in a super interesting time in Alberta, especially Southern Alberta right now, when river levels are at the lowest and reservoir levels are at the lowest that they've been for about 20 years. So it's not a new problem. It's a recurring problem, probably more than 20 years, but about 20 years ago was the last significant drought. And after that drought, we started adapting our policy. So the provincial government, government closed the Southern Alberta rivers to new allocations. That means that if you need river water in Southern Alberta, you have to now purchase a, an allocation from somebody else. And every time that happens, the province puts more water back into the river. Uh, they, they don't let the full allocation be sold. So that last drought changed the 
the way that the province is managing water in southern Alberta, most of which, I think more than 90% of the Old Man River is allocated for irrigation. So we were valid adapted because we had given out as a province um, more water than was in the river. There wasn't enough water in the river for the allocations in, I think it was 2002, but it might have been one or three and there may not be in 2024. And the province has already started discussions about how to manage if we don't get spring rains and if we, ha we have a water short season. So we are maladapted. There's no two ways about it. You know, and another question I asked myself is what we grow in Southern Alberta. And in my mind, I have this flow chart because we mostly grow, not, I, I have never seen the data, but we grow a lot of feed for, for cattle to eat beef. And I have this flow chart in my mind that says, should we eat beef? And, you know, you say, do you want to use more water than you might, then you shouldn't eat beef. But if you like the taste of beef and you can't not eat it, then, then you should eat beef. And you can go through lots of reasons. Carbon is another reason because it takes a lot more carbon to, to grow the protein in beef, which we love. Uh, and water contamination, river water by return by from feedlots and groundwater from, from feedlots and spreading of manure, which comes out of feedlots. There's lots of reasons to not eat uh, beef. And so we have maladapted ourselves in that regard as well. So I think the answer is yes, we are maladapting and changing our adaptation almost, you know, right now in a very significant way on an ongoing basis. Hmm. Would any of the other panelists like to answer that question as well or add to what Kathy has said? I, I can just say a couple of quick things. Um, I, I, I would certainly characterize it as well as very inefficient use. I know what the work they did in the Murray Darling Basin, the farmers are working with 60% of the water they used to get and they've doubled their productivity. Um, and, and so it's, it's close to a fourfold improvement in efficiency of water use by instrumenting all of the fields and controlling and measuring the water use and applying it more efficiently. So I, I think there's great strides we could do in being more efficient at using what we're, we're doing in, in recognition of, of where the future That's is That's really true. That's really true, Kelly. And the city of Calgary, I think, has decreased through at public education and incentives. I think they have decreased uh, per capita water use by 30% over the last 10 or 15 years. And the, the irrigation districts have, I think, it's fair to say, revolutionized the way that they deliver water to crops. So really good point. And we still need to do more. Uh, maybe to... Uh, um... I think it's important um, to manage water better um, uh, because uh, when we manage water, sometimes we use uh, diversions uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, one group and uh, for and that was said does not benefit another group. So I think it's important that um, what we do with water, it has to appease everyone, not just one group. And I'll speak from uh, Manitoba, a lot of uh, water management um, in Manitoba, like the lakes are managed uh, for one group with which impacts another group. So, and the way, and the reason a water is managed as well uh, needs to be taken into account, uh, whether it's for recreational purposes, whether it's for agriculture purposes, and uh, they have to come into agreement which one is more important. And also when, with the water control structures that are put in place up for whether it's for management recreation for agriculture what happens when the water is released what happens when uh, the water is kept back so uh, so it's important that uh, uh that the parties that come into agreement as one because 
a lot of the decisions that are being made are for the benefit of one and not for everybody. We're not of all of a society that, that uses that water body that's being studied upon. Thank you for your responses. I think that answered the question. Um, the next question is from Ash, and they are asking why the city of Calgary does not use groundwater as, as I'm guessing a water source. Does anyone have any experience with that and can give an answer? Well, the, the simple answer is that colonial population centers were intentionally situated right beside abundant and accessible water supply. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the military person whose name I forget was instructed to go at the confluence of the Elbow and the Bow Rivers, which currently provide water supply to, I don't know, like 1.4 million people to establish the fort, which is the precursor to Calgary. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, most major cities are established on significant surface water bodies because there was water supply. And the populations that aren't established on water supplies are, you know, if, if you were to look at a, a map of municipal water supply sources in Alberta or for communities, for, for towns, uh, they would be located mostly on highways that connect rivers that that sorry that connect the cities that are on on uh, river water supplies. So the highways connect the city, and the towns grow up around the transportation corridor. Merle might be better to talk about this, but the communities that are not located on good water supplies are the First Nations reservations. Are are located in places, and Merle, you should really speak to this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're getting at. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, First Nation communities across the country are located on uh, new water bodies. So whether rivers, lakes, whatever. And, uh, and uh, this is good because um, a lot of a lot of the remote communities that are not accessible by road. Uh, there's uh, still a lot of communities, uh, First Nation communities that are remote. So uh, they have access to water that is uh, clean water. And um, uh, so uh, the remoteness, I guess, that can be uh, both good or bad. Uh, but in terms of climate change and the economy, it's not so good. But uh, uh, they have access uh, to the water and um, clean water, whereas uh, other communities in the south where um, uh, there's a lot, uh, much more development. So uh, the communities in the south where uh, the First Nations live, reside, are more prone to flooding. Uh, they're more prone to pollution because of uh, uh, the runoff from uh, the um, uh, the activities, industrial activities, the developmental activities that are uh, that are in the south, the southern part, like uh, uh, like Kathy said, um, uh, the transportations are uh, the roads, the transportation links are closely linked with uh, the water bodies, and a lot of the towns, uh, cities are located along them, and uh, that's the same with uh, uh, with uh, with the First Nation communities along the south. And another thing too, if you look at the map of Canada, where a lot of the treaties, uh, the numbered uh, treaties are uh, with First Nations, uh, the numbered uh, treaties uh, from one to 11, uh, you can see that they're uh, located along, along if uh, you take uh, the Lake Winnipeg watershed, you can almost put it identical to the treaties uh, where they are. So, so that's really significant that when you think of that water, uh, the close relationship and the importance of water to uh, the indigenous peoples 
uh, because we say water is life, but a lot of times uh, water is water is water is uh, pitted against us where where water uh, where water becomes an enemy and water kills us from flooding, etc. Those are good points. I think I think that does address the question of why it is that cities are not using groundwater, which may be more resilient to climate change. Um, there's a question for Kathy directly in the Q&A chat from Doreen asking how well groundwater is mapped and understood in Alberta. Mm. So the, the about 30% of Albertans rely on groundwater for a household water supply. Many of those are in rural prop well, they're in communities along transport transportation corridors between cities that drink river water. Many of them are rural properties, either farms or acreages that people live in that have domestic wells. And Alberta, outside of the uh, mountains, does not have the greatest aquifers. They have, you know, if you put a well in right beside a river, you can pump a lot of water out, but that's really what we call groundwater under the influence of surface water. And you'll pump basically surface water after a short period of time. So we don't have great aquifers. Uh, and the best one that we have is kind of a, a wedge that comes from the edge of the mountains uh, to east of Calgary and, and not as far as Edmonton and halfway between Calgary and, and Lethbridge, and that's called the Pascapoo Aquifer. So if you drive along Highway 1 between Calgary and, and the Front Ranges, you will see some outcrops, and those are Pascapoo outcrops. And if you drill a well into those outcrops, uh, you may or may not get water, depending on whether you hit an old river bed, you know, like a, a river bed of geologic age. And that's the best aquifer that we have, provides spotty well water supply. And it has been pretty extensively studied by a number of researchers by Alberta uh, Geologic Survey. And then we have uh, hundreds of thousands of wells that are part of that the province collects in a water well database, which is publicly available. If you search on Alberta water well, database, it will come up and you can look at wells in any region that you live in and see drillers logs, which are not the same as oil and gas logs, um, because drillers are practical people that can drill wells very nicely, but don't get down into the, the um, esoteric details of describing geology. And so we, we know some aquifers really well no, other other parts of the province, not so well. And you know, as oil and gas exploits more groundwater, particularly in the northern parts of the province where there's not so much shortage of surface water, we learn more and more. And uh, we don't know that much really in the mountains uh, because people don't rely on groundwater very much in the mountains. Okay. Kind of a long and convoluted answer. Sorry for not being more concise. No, it's a detailed answer. And it's clearly an important question because people are asking about groundwater in Alberta. Um, Willem has another question directed towards the whole panel. If we think 50 to 100 years in the future, do you all think that Calgary or Southern Alberta's water sources might or will dry up? And if yes, is this treated as the emergency it seems to be? Uh, who, Kelly, would you like to take this one first? Uh, well, I'm not a hydrologist, um, but I would think it's unlikely that they're going to totally dry up. I would think that we're, we're going to see reduced resources, but I don't think they're going to dry up. But I'm not a hydrologist, and Kathy's probably better better placed, although she's a groundwater hydrologist. But certainly, the, you know, the groundwater and rainfall contribute a lot of the, the flow to the river. But I'll toss that tennis ball across to Kathy. 
Yeah, so I don't think they're going to dry up because, you know, it's a water cycle. So for us to have no water supply, we would have to become a desert like the uh, that doesn't receive significant precipitation. Uh, so I don't think that they'll dry up. I think that they're going to evolve. And it's our task as, as people who live here, as uh, agencies that work here, to start adapting as they change in order to ensure that, that the ecosystem, the parts of the water ecosystem that can't speak for themselves and, and the people have enough, uh, have enough water for the most important needs. So if I can oh, go ahead, Kathy. Well, I was just going to say that we currently use a uh, water law that was developed more than a hundred years ago. And based on, I just learned a couple of uh, weeks ago, based on mining, gold mining in the Northwestern US. So we use Western water law, which is first in time, first in right, or prior allocation. And I think I'm hearing the province starting to ask whether a hundred year old water law is still appropriate for us to use in Alberta. And I am really interested in participating in that discussion and listening. Kelly, please. I just wanted to say in, in areas of that are water scarce in Chile, a hundred percent of the flow of the river is is used for agriculture. And what's left in the river is is just municipal wastewater that goes in after use. And so there's large parts of the country that rivers uh, don't make it to the ocean at, at all. You know, we do some work in, in one part of the river in a national park, which has a beautiful river. And at the bottom of the, the Andes, when the river hits the flatland, it runs into a winery and 100% of the water from the river is used to make wine. And so the concept of ecosystem services and protecting uh, water for uh, all of those voices that that don't have have a, a voice um, isn't isn't recognized everywhere. And and so I think a bigger hazard than the river drying up is is people fighting over the river so much that they use a hundred percent of it rather than leaving any for uh, the natural system. You know, interestingly, oh, Merle, after you. Uh, maybe I can add to that. Uh, it's really interesting. We talk about uh, water, uh, but um, uh, going back to uh, the meaning of words, uh, when we talk about water and uh, the reason why Saskatchewan is named Saskatchewan by the Indigenous peoples, and that's an Indigenous word, the Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe word. Um, uh, what that means, is a uh, Saskatchewan now uh, when I'll use a, an example of a kettle that's boiling uh, boiling on on fire uh, what happens is that the water eventually uh, boils dry boils dry and that's what that means uh, Saskatchewan 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 means where the uh, where the water runs dry and the uh, province of Saskatchewan and before the borders that's what the name that was given to the region because of the water there coming from uh, the watershed of the Rockies uh, flowing east. When um, uh, when the water got there, this Kachuan, it went dry. Uh, so I think it's important that to learn from the words that are given and uh, give them a uh, current context, what they mean, and we can learn from them. I didn't know that meaning of the word Saskatchewan, actually. Um, just to quickly follow up on that, Marjan is asking in the Q&A chat if you could explain about, or tell us more about three-eyed seeing. The question is for you, Marl. Yeah, uh, three-eyed seeing is, uh, is uh, the framework that I'm using and that I developed uh, that includes Indigenous science, Western science, and our relations. And from that, we can uh, we can we can work together because we have to include uh, we have to include those voices that, that that cannot speak for themselves. For example, we're talking about water. Water has a voice too, and we have to learn we have to learn to listen to it. 
we have to be the voice for the water. What is water telling us? And uh, the indigenous, uh, the indigenous eye uh, includes uh, the Anishinaabe laws, which is uh, the natural law, uh, the creation law, traditional law, and the language law. And then we have the Western eye, which includes, uh, for example, uh, some of um, uh, the uh, the disciplines that, that we have here, um, uh, the engineering uh, uh, hydrologist, uh, the ecologist, biologist, and those are some of the disciplines. And then we have our relations, which represent the water, which represent the land, which represent the soil, which represents uh, represent species and these are all living things that if we remove uh, the air from them they die soil we all know that if you remove the air and the aeration of soil uh, the water too uh, the water if I re you remove the oxygen from the water land as well uh, when you cut down a tree, uh, you basically, uh, you end their life. So everything is living. So we have to be the voice. Uh, we have to recognize what these voices are telling us. And we have to be the eye. We have to be the voice for them. Okay. Um, there's a question in the Q&A section by Agnieszka. And the question is, how would communities in Canada effectively build resilience to flash drought events, considering their unpredictable nature and potential long-term impacts on agricultural water resources and ecosystem? Would anyone want to, to take this one? I, I can start and then, then uh, I'll look forward to Merle and Kelly's thoughts. So there's all kinds of definitions of drought. So an agricultural drought is when there's not enough water to, to grow crops. A, a hydrologic drought is based on a river flow or an amount of precipitation. A groundwater drought is based on subsurface water levels. And there's something called anthropogenic drought. And so <laughs> I couldn't not look at the rivers.alberta.ca page, which in which you can see levels of reservoirs and flows in rivers on an on a real-time basis during the open water season when the gauges are operating. And that's about uh, April 1st until the end of October. And if you look at the and so that you know we've all seen these ast astonishing photos of the old man which is high and dry reservoir and other places in, you know, we've seen crow's nest uh, river towns trying to dig into the riverbed to access water. Uh, but if you look carefully at the, at the distribution of the lowest water levels, basically the further east you get, the less water there is because we use it up. So, and, and, on the river that we've mostly studied, which is the Elbow River, which is the only river in the world that I have been able to find whose major end use is drinking water for the city of Calgary just before it flows into the Bow River. 60% uh, of the river flow on an average year comes from groundwater. So the, so the river doesn't stop, the river will keep flowing. And if we didn't use water, then, then we wouldn't have as severe a drought problem. And you know, when Kelly was speaking, I was thinking when, when he was talking about Chilean rivers that don't re reach the ocean because they're all used up, which is the case with the Colorado River also, which is a fascinating story. Uh, I, I wondered to myself whether the 1948 Interprovincial Agreement, which is overseen by the Prairie Provinces Water Board, which is under the Canadian Water Act, so that agreement states that Alberta has got to let 50% of our river flow go into the prairie provinces. And if that agreement weren't in place, I wonder if we would use up all of the of the of the rivers. If if I can follow up quickly, recognizing we're running short on on time. Um, in in Alberta or in Alberta in Australia, the Murray Darling when they went to their new water allocation system. 
they they took the licenses all back and they gave people an allocation based on a proportion of flow that their license represented. And then um, in every year, they look at the amount of water in the reservoir. And if it's a water rich year, you get that percentage of the allocation. And if it's a water poor year, you get that percentage of the allocation. So it's not a fixed amount you get. It's a proportion of the allocation um, that you get. Right. And those are now tradable. So in dry years, uh, water is worth a lot of money and people who grow hay sell their water to fruit farmers. And in water rich years, everybody farms. So it's it's a very interesting system, um, it, which which varies year to year based on the amount of water that's available for consumption. And and maybe I can end off with that. Um, when we talk about droughts and floods, these are natural cycles that are recognized by indigenous peoples, but uh, the way we have responded to them. Um, it's not natural. Uh, we, uh, man, man, uh, man has interfered with the construction of um, of a water control structure. Uh, uh, so, and a lot of these uh, the interruptions um, they've exacerbated the uh, the effects of uh, what the onslaught of. Uh, for example, climate change, uh, because of uh, the alteration of uh, water, water levels, more, uh, more heat, less heat, etc. So, uh, I think um, uh, it would be important uh, to revisit uh, the importance of uh, the natural cycles, why they were, why, why they exist, and the natural laws behind uh, these uh, cycles, because uh, they were meant. Uh, if uh, there's a flood, it's meant for uh, the rejuvenation of the land, and uh, that's why they they were accepted. Indigenous peoples doing, did not go build dams. Uh, um, dams. Uh, there's an ecosystem of um, of a uh, people that I shouldn't say people species that control uh, the ecosystem as well. Like uh, what are um, beavers? They have uh, their own dams, and it's part of the way the ecosystem is designed. Uh, there, uh, uh, there's a natural water controller, <laughs> if you want to put it that. <laughs> but I'll leave it at that, though. Okay. Thank you so much for your insightful questions. Um, questions to the participants and thank you for the great answers to the unfortunately we're running out running out of time so before we wrap up i would like to extend a heartful thank you to all of our distinguished panelists dr ballard dr ryan and dr monkitrick for sharing their expertise and insights with us and your contributions today have really enriched our understanding of building resilience to environmental change, particularly concerning water resources. I'd also like to express gratitude to the attendees for your ac active participation. There were lots of great questions today. Um, and I hope that this is just the beginning of a greater conversation. Um, your engagement has made the webinar a success, and I hope that as we conclude, going forward, the lessons we've learned today, we can continue our efforts to address challenges of environmental change and promote resilience in our own communities and ecosystems. So I'll just say thank you again. Thank you.